Uh, as I said, we, we favor the malolactic fermentation. We, in principle, want it to be achieved. Which, well, generally, it works very easily on its own. Uh, when it doesn't, uh, and some are not working, we inoculate the other one. And uh, in principle, it works. And it didn't work a few times, I explained, and we, 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 uh, we got without, uh, without doing it. So, after, after the fermentation, we take what I consider as our big risk in the sense that we don't rack. At all, we keep all the leaves. And this is a relatively risky process because when, when you look at what leaves are, it's a sort of mud, which can also always give you some uh, reduction aromas, mushroomy taste, some bad things. Here again, it is because we know what has happened before and we have the benefit of using good fruits properly pressed. That's the reason why we want the good fruits. We believe that the leaves should be good, and if they are good, we keep them, and if we, have, we keep them, we use them. And after the fermentation, so very, sometimes in December, we begin uh, a period of three to four months of batonnage of uh, leaf serum. We do that once a week. And we conduct batonnage for, for, for three reasons. The first is, I would say, subjective, uh, but we consider and we, we think that it gives more uh, Creaminess, more onctuousness, more body to the wine. Some people say it's wrong, we think it's true, but so let's concentrate on the two objective reasons. Uh, the first is that it has an antioxidative effect, which will help us to lower the quantity of sulfite needed to protect the wine. In an ideal world, which means that it doesn't always work, uh, we would like that our sulfite addition happen first just after pressing to protect and uh, very tiny. And the second one would happen only between 4 to 15 years later at the disgorgement. But in fact, it doesn't always work. I will tell you why uh, later. The third advantage, uh, which is uh, due only uh, to the fact that we are in Champagne, is uh, related to the stability of the wine. You know the tartaric acid crystals that you can find in a bottle of white wine could be... Uh, this could be point for the mousse to expand. Mm. You would open the bottle and, of course, lose half of it in the face of your neighbor, which is not a good idea. And that's the reason why, if you don't want this to open the bottle, you have to be pretty sure that it has happened before nothing. The normal technique is cold temperature. And, uh, in fact, even our ancestors knew that because when they were putting their barrels outside during winter to clarify the wine, it had also the effect of crystallizing the tartaric mm -hmm. acid. So today this is done artificially. You call stabilize your wine, refrigerate I minus four, let them for two or three days, rack, filter, and that's it. Except that here we have not to do that because in the leaves you have some components which are called the manoproteins. And please don't ask how this works. I have absolutely <laughs> no idea how they work, but simply it helps the tartaric acid to crystallize at cellar temperature, uh, I should say semi-cellar temperature because we are in winter and of course we, we open the, the doors. In principle, if everything has worked properly, and sometimes in April, we check, uh, we analyze, and if it's okay, we can for the first time rack, clean the bowl, put the wine back in it, and that finish, which means that we would have avoided two things. First, the very strong thermic shock that the wine is getting by being refrigerated from 14 to minus 4 in half a second, and 2 it means that we can also avoid the filtration which follows. Mm. So this is, uh, this is very, a very good system. Uh, it doesn't always work. And in fact, in the, we began to experiment that uh, in the mid-1990s. We generalized that to all our wines in 2000. So it means that with 2010 we are at the 11th harvest and it has worked nine times and failed twice. It failed in 2006 and failed in 2010 too. Uh, why? We don't know. We simply saw that uh, in fact we still have quite a lot of tartaric. So we had uh, obviously to change our, our mind and uh, we had to call stabilize and, and filter what will become the QV738 as it has already, already been the case with QV734. Some people already told me, uh, yes, but maybe you should take the risk, you know, which are really those amateurs of natural wines. And uh, the problem is that even the most extreme 
of the amateur of natural wine will never accept two things. First, that the bottle of champagne more or less explodes in his hands when he opens it, mm -hmm. and two, that the bottle of champagne doesn't sparkle. Mm -hmm. So at the end, we have we have to be pragmatic, yeah. and when it's Mother Nature cool. doesn't want something to happen, we have to we have to force it. And uh, so that that's the reason why it didn't work. So we are in uh, April May, and we have now to decide what we will do with the wines. And in fact, today we can use them in 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 four different ways. We can decide that after all, that barrel or that one is not as good as we expected when we sell it. It doesn't happen very often because it's something that we prefer to do at harvest time, but it may happen. Second possibility, it's good, but we don't want to use it now, so the juices are, or the wine, are transferred in some of the stainless steel tanks or in some of concrete tanks with epoxia inside to be stored as a reserve wine to be used in the future. Third possibility, blending the wine from the harvest and adding with the wine, we should make an vintage, but I will remember you uh, how different our concept is from the classical vintage. And the fourth possibility that we bottle separately, or we can bottle separately, up to four different single vintages. And uh, just to finish about the winemaking, I told you about sulfite addition, uh, which doesn't always work. In fact, it most of the time works for the single vineyard and not for the blend. It's not a problem of the wine being different. It is the fact that single vineyard, the wine will go almost directly from the barrel to the bottle. The blend, you have more movements, but of course you have, you have to protect. Mm -hmm. So, again, in a way for us to have something which will oxidize to too far. I would say that uh, at that stage I can say that uh, Jackson visit is over because everything which happens uh, later is... Yes. This is, is called aging charlotte. Sure, sure, of course, but that being the name of the digital needs which will be put the bottles uh, together. Course. The aging and the aging process is in fact two, two uh, different uh, things. We have first what is the exchange between, between the wine the inside and the atmosphere outside through most of the time uh, from uh, but not always, I will tell you more about that. Yeah. And of course you have this typical uh, champagne process which is the yeast totalizes. So the yeast that we have uh, added. Yeah. Yeah. And then physically it takes uh, just a few I would say a few months to achieve uh, the second fermentation, but it needs, you need much more time than that uh, for the wine to be tasteable. Uh, Chrome cap, they progressively replaced uh, corks and a clamp uh, at the end of the 1960s and the beginning of the, 19th, uh, the 1970s. Why? Uh, because, in fact, they were easier to work, more regular, and obviously without any cork taste. Mm. The problem is that the aging doesn't happen the same way if you have a cork or if you have a chrome cap. If you have a chrome cap, uh, when you bottle the wine, you have almost no exchange. It, was ex it is extremely tight. But the more you wait, the more the seals become a bit loose, and the more the exchange increases. Which is exactly the opposite of what happens with a cork. Mm. If you have a cork, you have a lot of oxygen coming through at the beginning, and then the more you wait, the tighter the cork becomes, and the less the change uh, will, uh, will last, uh, will happen. Uh, which means that for a long aging, you immediately think that the cork will be better. And in fact, it is better, that's the reason why uh, Laurent and I, at the beginning of our career, we conducted some experiments of aging the wine with corks and clamps for some special, specially long aging wines like a 89, like a 95. And then we stopped using corks. And, and for, uh, I would say, one good reason and one bad reason. The good reason was the increase in quality of the crown caps. And the bad reason was the opposite, the decrease in quality of the corks. Mm. But believe it or not, we have changed our minds again two years ago, mm. uh, especially because of the 95 avis that you, that you know. And uh, comparing an, an Avis 95, which had been aged with corks, and compared to one with, co with chrome cap, the difference was so amazing that we decided that from our, for our single vineyard, uh, we'll, be, we'll go back to the uh, cork and clamp aging mm. from the vintage 2008, because we were uh, early uh, in 2009. And I will show you. Uh, just keep something in mind, it is the timing of all this. 
uh, we have about between 8 to 10 months be between harvest and bottling. We will have between eight, 6 to 8 months between breeding and shipment, which means that most of the time the wine waits horizontally lying and uh, improving. We hope. So, uh, when we decide to ship, we have to eliminate the yeast, but before eliminating them, we have to put them in position to be eliminated. This is the purpose of the riddling. So, you put your bottle, you put it uh, in those pupitres, pieces of wood with holes of special shape. You put your bottle as horizontally as possible. After two weeks, you need the two weeks for the yeast to go against the glass, because they have been moved during the transport. Uh, you begin to turn, and the idea is that you turn by eight or quarter of turns in one way or another, which means that you are balancing your bottle. Mm -hmm. So the yeasts which are more or less doing that are progressively moving in the middle. But as at the same time that you uh, turn, you also progressively change the angle. Mm -hmm. In fact, your yeasts are doing this. So it's a system which works very well, but 40 years ago, about uh, someone had a brilliant idea. He, he was a friend of my father. Uh, he, he had a little, he was a little negos, and he was so so little that he was doing the reading himself, which is one of the most boring tasks you can think about. <laughs> believe me, I did it, and it is really boring. So, and, and he was he was a very smart guy. He was not very passionate about the product. He was a bit like Adolf Jackson, very passionate about the technique. And one day he said to him, he, he spoke to himself and he said, instead of turning them one by one, I should find a way to turn, to, maybe to put them in a case and to turn the case. So he thought a lot about the system and he invented it, patented it, sold it, and made a lot of money. This is what we use. Well, here, upside down. Here you have a compressor which is refrigerating a, a liquid to minus 23, 24. So you take the cover. Up. <laughs> you put your bottles vertically. The height of the liquid has been calculated, so you have about one and a half centimeter of the bottle, which is under the level of the liquid. So after 15 minutes, the quantity of wine which is under the level uh, is freezing. So you have a little piece of ice which which is formed, which includes all the ice. Or the yeast, mm -hmm. so you can take your bottle in the right position and the yeast are blocked in the ice. You rinse it and you reach that first machine, which is a disgorging machine. Mm. It takes your bottle, put it at an angle of 45 degrees, and with a sort of knife, will put the crown cap out. Because of the pressure created by the second fermentation, your little piece of ice is expulsed. So here your bottle becomes vertical again after having lost about one and a half centiliter of wine, but all the yeast. So you can move to the second machine, which will, uh, in fact, uh, add the liqueur de dosage. Liqueur dosage, we talked about liqueur de tirage, same mm. principle, sugar mm. blended in with the wine. It's used for three different purposes. The first one is that, uh, as you all know, in Champagne, we are perfectly honest people. You are buying 75 centiliters, we have lost some, we have to replace it. <laughs> that is the first reason why we have to use the liquor de dosage. The second purpose is to determine if the wine will be non-dosé, extra brut, brut, sec or demi-sec, because this sugar will not ferment. And the, four, the third purpose is for some people to work a lot on the quality of the wine, or the reason why in which they blend the sugar, and it's a sort of final touch of the blend. For us, it is mostly the first reason, because, but I will we give you more detail when we replace the wine. So we cook, we have the gelée, and here we will turn the bottle upside down three times, just to blend the liqueur and the wine which have the same density. If you do nothing, all the liqueur will, will go at the bottom. Mm. And after that, nothing will put the bottles in pallets, and they will go back to the cellars for at least six months. Uh, for instance, uh, the single vineyard which will be released in September have been disgorged in mid-February. And that's it. Uh